have a vivid memory of the day I learned Trayvon Martin was killed. My Facebook news feed was filled with some of my friends who were pregnant with black boys at the time, complaining about not being able to sleep, feeling anxious, frustrated, angry, hopeless. They were lamenting bringing their children into this world. Juxtaposed to that anguish were some posts from some of my white friends who were giggling about adorable kitten memes, posting cupcake recipes. Some of them were talking about the death of Trayvon, but it was clear that none of them were holding in their bodies or felt personally threatened by the death of this stranger. I have since become the mother of a delightfully precocious and sweet little boy. I am curious about his personality and who he'll become, and I admire the cook in his smile. But I also wonder when the oohs and the ahs, the gushing of strangers, will turn into clutched purses, fear, or perceptions of threat. For me, Trayvon is not a stranger. He's my son. And the threat that killed him is not easily exchanged for kitten memes or cupcake recipes. The threat that killed Trayvon is something that I consider every day as a mother and as a scientist. As a scientist, my work focuses on how our lived experiences contribute to racial inequalities in health. I'm haunted by this pattern in the data that indicates that blacks fare worse than whites when it comes to health. For the 15 leading causes of disease, heart disease, sorry, 15 leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, stroke, hypertension, blacks have an earlier onset, faster progression, and earlier death than whites. What's particularly striking about this pattern is that it persists at every level of socioeconomic status. Even when we account for education, income, health insurance, we still see this difference between blacks and whites. What do we do with that? If it's not education, it's not income, why is race explaining health? How do we account, how do we understand the probability of my dying sooner than my white counterparts in spite of my education and income. This collision of this deeply personal part of my life and my professional life has led me to a question of what would it take? What would it take for you to understand that racism is more complex than being called a name or even violence at the hands of police? What would it take for you to accept that we still live in a world where the color of someone's skin can get them killed, passed over for a job, denied a loan, denied housing, a fair shot? What would it take for the videos and reports of black bodies being gunned down by police to register as a pattern of racism and not merely as a consequence of insubordination? or criminality? What would it take for the outcries of racial injustice to register, not as a sensitivity or as a card to be played, but as an unacceptable social reality? What would it take for the data you see and that you say you get? What would it take for, that to, for you to connect and feel the reality behind that data? What would it take for you to not just feel bad or to empathize, but to act and think differently? To refuse to live in a world where the color of one's skin can dictate their health or well being? I talk a lot about racism, and I'm used to there being a point in the conversation for the audience to turn inward. They start focusing on their emotions of guilt, shame, anger indifference, I'm going to ask you to not do that. Stay in the room with me, stay present. 
There's a quote I like by Dr. George Yancey in a letter that he uh, published in the New York Times that he addressed to white America. And in this letter he says, I'm asking you to look deep, to look into your soul with silence, to quiet that voice that will speak to you of your white innocence. Take a deep breath. Make room for my voice in the deepest part of your psyche. Try to be silent. Practice listening. So what I'm asking you to do is to not focus on how it feels for you to hear me describe oppression, but focus on the oppression. When I talk to my students, I often give an example of me describing someone on the ground with a boot on their neck, and they're focused on what it feels like to look at someone on the ground with a boot on their neck, as opposed to focusing on the person on the ground with a boot on their neck. Focus on the oppression. I am a professor in, at Columbia University in New York City and in a school of social work at that. I am grateful to be surrounded by people who share my values of racial justice and racial equity. But I also find that even people who believe, espouse these beliefs of racial justice and racial equity don't always understand racial injustice or racial inequity. They don't always get how that really shows up in people's lives and in society. I find that it's easier to build consens consensus on what should be and much more difficult to build consensus on what is. It's much easier to agree that the world should be a fair place and that my kid deserves the same shot as your kid. And it's much more difficult to get on the same page about barriers that show up that prevent us from living in that reality. In our change project, we're exploring the ways to use virtual reality to bridge this gap in understanding. We're asking the question, can we immerse people in a virtual experience of racism that helps them to better understand the complexities of the realities of racism? We are using quantitative and qualitative data that demonstrates that there are racial differences in how kids are disciplined in their classroom, hiring practices, policing, demonstrated in empirical data the ways in which racism shows up in people's lives in multiple spaces across the life course. In collaboration with Jeremy Balenson of the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford University and my team, the Cogburn Research Group, and the Brown Institute of Media Innovation, it's a lot of people, at <laughs> Columbia University, we are asking you to step into the life or the virtual shoes of Michael Sterling. We're asking you to think about the ways that you can embody an experience that's not your own. We know that we can help you through a virtual avatar feel and experience what your virtual avatar is feeling and experiencing. We have used complex uses of quantitative and qualitative data to construct narratives of race and racism through the life of Michael Sterling. We're asking you to think about what it feels like to be Michael at age seven, age 15, 30, and 50. At age seven, you're in a classroom playing with your friends, tossing blocks as airplanes and flying robots, and suddenly your white female teacher appears hovering over you, scolding you for being aggressive and dangerous. You need to calm down, Michael. You're gonna hurt someone. Go sit in time out. You're not acting any differently than your white peers. And as you sit in time out, as an avatar, looking at your face in the mirror, we're asking you to reflect on how it felt to be treated that way as you watch your white peers continue to play. At age 15, you're preparing to go to a basketball game with your friend Jacob, who's white, and he's waiting, at you at the door, waiting for you at the door. Before you leave, your mother asks you to stop. She's watching the local news, and she realizes that the police are looking for someone who's wearing something very similar to you. She asks you to change. You resist. You're running late for the game. She stops and says, 
don't forget what happened to your brother. You change your shirt, assure your mother that you'll be okay, and head out of the house. As you head to the game, you're waving to neighbors on the street. Jacob decides to run and catch the bus so that you're not late. As soon as you make the same choice to jaywalk, you're accosted by police officers who instruct you, the user, in the headset to get on your knees and put your hands up. Again, this might seem extreme, but it's based on real data on stop and frisk practices in New York City. As you hear the sounds of police yelling at you, neighbors intervening on your behalf, the sound shuts off in quiet. And we fade back to your mother sitting in the house, watching the local news, hearing the same sounds and sirens, not realizing that this incident involves her son. At age 30, you're getting ready for an interview, the opportunity of a lifetime. You're well-educated, you have great experiences, you're prepared, but you enter this very white space. The old white founders are hanging on the walls. The magazines in front of you are covered with white faces. When the interviewer comes in, he goes immediately to the white candidate who's waiting with you and says, you must be our candidate from Yale. He's not. You are. The receptionist corrects the interviewer, who then acknowledges your presence and says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. We'll be right with you, as he takes the white candidate back for the interview. You don't get the job. At age 50, we ask you to look into a mirror at your aged face, reflecting on the experiences that have happened to you, but also seeing video overlays of other black boys, girls, men and women who are also sharing their experiences at various points in their lives in various spaces across their life course. It's not just Michael, it's not just at age seven, it's many people who carry these experiences across their lives. We're not only leveraging the power of technology, we're leveraging the power of science, if you will. We are, as I said, using quantitative and qualitative data to construct these complex narratives in a virtual experience. But we're also employing experimental design to think about how we can assess changes at the individual and group level. Are we moving the needle? Are people different as a result of going through this experience? I believe that achieving racial justice requires that we understand racism. Not an understanding that emerges from intellectual exercise or in the production or consumption of science, but one that is based in your body, in your spirit, as much as reason. So I ask you again, what would it take for you to not just feel bad or empathize, but to act and think differently? What would it take?